Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the first session of the of Carbon is Key. My name is Brian McLean. I'm the Director of Communications and Sustainability at AGS Airports. I'm joining you from Glasgow, which is playing host to what is probably the most important COP since Paris in 2015. And this afternoon session, it's an opportunity really to discuss how the aviation industry is responding to the most fundamental challenge of our time, the climate emergency. Uh, I'm pleased to say we have an excellent lineup of speakers. We're joined this afternoon by Derek Proven, Chief Executive of AGS Airports, Jonathan Council, Group Head of Sustainability at IAG, Dan Williams, Senior International Advisor, FF FAA's Office of Environment and Energy, Jean Gabolis, Chief Executive of World Energy, and Martin Bowman, Director of Aviation Technology at Deloitte. Now, before we begin, just um, a few um, house rules. You can put questions or comments uh, to any of the speakers at any time uh, via the chat area, which you can hopefully see on your right. We'll try to respond to everybody. And delegates can also communicate in private or public uh, with groups of up to six people using the front row networking tool, uh, which you will see on the bottom right of your screen. So on to our first guest. Uh, Derek Proven uh, joined AGS Airports, which owns Aberdeen, Glasgow and Southampton Airports, as chief ex executive back in April 2018. Born in Glasgow, uh, Derek's over 20 years of experience in aviation and he joined AGS from Heathrow, where he was chief operating officer. Prior to that, he spent three years as the managing director of Aberdeen Airport. Uh, however, I'm pleased to say he's come full circle as it was here in Glasgow that Derek started his uh, aviation career back in 1998. Welcome, Derek. Um, first of all, can I just ask you to give a more of an overview, I suppose, of AGS and, and outline some of the steps uh, the group's taking to address the, the sustainability challenge? Yeah, thank you, Brian. And I think that was a, a great in introduction. AGS is the UK's second largest airport group owning Aberdeen, Glasgow and Southampton. We uh, drive around £2 billion to the UK economy uh, every year. And it's really important for us that we tackle this climate change challenge head on as a business and more importantly, as an aviation industry. Uh, we have already started our uh, challenge and our plans and route towards net zero as we start to move forward. Firstly, over the last three years, we've halved our uh, direct emissions. And in 2020, all of our airports uh, became carbon neutral. We also have a very detailed roadmap to net zero, which we'll see us hit net zero for scopes one and two uh, by the mid 2030s. And that roadmap is both costed and board improved. Uh, we also have had some firsts, like we were the first airport uh, group in the UK to have a fleet of uh, electric vehicles in our midst. But there's so much more for us to do, and hopefully later on uh, I'll be able to share some of that with you. That, that's great, Derek. Thanks for that. Um, I'm wondering if, if I can maybe delve a bit more into some of the examples uh, of the initiatives that, that AGS has undertaken. You mentioned that we're, uh, I say we, because uh, Derek is my boss, but uh, some of the initiatives we, we have been undertaking uh, here, here at the Aberdeen, Glasgow and Southampton airports. Yeah, so uh, earlier on this year, we launched our sustainability strategy with the uh, Scottish government. And in there, we have founded our strategy on the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals. And so therefore that becomes the precursor and the foundation by which we operate. And of course, the environmental impact and climate change is a key factor in everything that we do. But we also look at the social and the economic benefits that we can drive both as an industry and again as an airport. Now, we have um, a number of areas in which we are looking at beyond decarbonisation, particularly around the circular uh, economy. And we're very proud of some of the things that we've done to date. We were the first uh, airport, Glasgow Airport was the first airport in the world to introduce LEDs in uh, the full uh, apron area. We look from a, a circular economy uh, perspective to look to reduce uh, single use plastic. So, for example, all of our security bags are biodegradable. Therefore, we are reducing over two and a half million 
security bags every year as a single use plastic. We also um, ensure that in our F&B uh, premises, all of our cups can be recycled. Again, reducing tens of thousands of single use paper cups going to waste every year. We also look at our food waste. And you know one of the things I'm really proud of is that from a food waste perspective, all of our food waste is turned into a biogas or a fertilizer. And that fertilizer goes back onto the local farms for the produce for next year's crops. So you know, beyond decarbonization, there's so much more that we're doing and so much more we believe that the industry can do going forward. Thanks, Derek. They're great. I mean, that probably brings me on to you know what next and and more specifically, the role of innovation. You know, what role does innovation have to play uh, on our collective journey to net zero? And actually, before you answer that, I, I think we, we have a video that can, can share and articulate uh, another initiative that I know is very close to your heart. We are Kalis, a research project assessing the benefits and challenges of using drones within our healthcare, transport and delivery systems in Scotland. The concept of air travel remains relatively unchanged since its inception. Whilst air transport movements have grown exponentially and aircraft have become more developed in terms of efficiency, they are still very manual and reliant on non-renewable energy sources. Medical logistic networks rely heavily on the existing infrastructure with supplies, samples and medicines transported by road, ferry and aircraft with patients often having to travel from remote and rural areas to receive treatment. A recent report undertaken by PwC examined the impact of drones on the UK's economy, jobs, productivity and quality of life and estimates the impact by 2030 to be 16 billion in net cost savings, an increase to GDP by 42 billion pounds, in the region of 76,000 drones in use across UK skies and over 628,000 jobs in the drones economy. Care and Equity Logistics, UAS Scotland or Kalis Project is part funded by Innovate UK's Future Flight Fund, Phase 2. Kalis seeks to demonstrate the value drones could add to a medical logistics network in Scotland with a view to establishing what would be the UK's first national drone logistics network. The consortium of 14 partners, led by AGS, bring a wide range of technical and industry expertise to support Kalis in achieving its aims and objectives. The project comprises of four key work streams. Creation of a digital twin demonstrator, economic viability and market analysis, beyond visual line of sight, BB loss, trials in non-segregated airspace, and public and social perception analysis. There is an opportunity, better access to healthcare for rural and remote communities, faster response times, reduced road congestion and CO2 emissions, opportunities for other services like power line inspection, emergency response and parcel delivery and many more. The project commenced in December 2020 and is scheduled to last for 18 months with live flight trials underway in early 2022. Be sure to keep up to date and hear our latest news by visiting our website or LinkedIn. That's great, Derek. I mean, I don't think many people would associate an airport group working with a, the NHS to address an issue like. Could, could you share a, a few more details and how this is coming about and you know how you feel about it? Yeah, so I mean, this is one that we're really, really proud of uh, at AGS. But I think a point I would like to make at the start that it's only possible for us to do this by having partnerships and alliances with other organizations where we can access the knowledge and experience capability, whether it be technical or otherwise, and some of the, that financial resource that's required to deliver step change as we look to deliver uh, innovation into climate change. And clearly innovation is how we're going to uh, create the, the solutions to the challenges that face uh, the planet today. And at AGS, we don't speak just about innovation, we speak about innovation with purpose. And I think this is a great example of innovation with purpose. What we're looking to do is be the first uh, 
trial in the UK to use beyond visual line of sight for drones. And, you know, let's face it, airports and drones are not normally good bedfellows. But today we can see a real advantage working with NHS where we can now look at delivering key medical supplies and key medical treatments. So let me give you an example. Uh, an example would be that if you are a cancer patient and you require um, a blood transfusion, the aerated blood must reach you within two hours. If it doesn't, then that blood supply is no longer of any value to you in your treatment. And of course, we're talking about people who are really unwell, that are unable to travel for hours from home with their illness to hospitals in some case. And just now, if we look at some of the remote rural areas that we have in and around Scotland, by the time a vehicle travels that distance, apart from the environmental impact it's having, there are many reasons why it might not get there in time, especially if you live on the islands uh, or, or even in the remote part of the highlands uh, in Scotland. You've also got boat trips, as in ferries, for that treatment. These drones will be able to hit all parts of Scotland with uh, well within that two-hour limit, meaning people get life-saving treatment. So for us, we believe that we can actually revolutionise the way health is, uh, healthcare is provided and delivered, uh, not only in Scotland, but with us as a trial across the UK. And we're really excited that early next year we'll go into a live trial solution. So when we speak about innovation with purpose, this is an example of what we mean by that. That's great, Derek. I mean, today is Health and Innovation Day at COP, so uh, thank, thanks for sharing that uh, example. It's entirely apt. So, so that's um, probably a good overview of what AGS is looking at uh, as we address the sustainability challenge. Is there anything happening within the wider industry at the moment that's exciting you? So I think um, we were fortunate to hold uh, an exhibition with uh, exhibition event with Boeing just a couple of weeks ago. And in there, the key part of that exhibition was about sustainable aviation fuel. Um, airlines are saying today that they believe that 65% of their journey to net zero will rely on sustainable aviation fuels, and it could reduce aviation's emissions by 30% by 2050. Therefore, it's key that we now turn that from um, a concept into a reality. And we were able to uh, prove just a couple of weeks ago, that that reality is here. You know, people tend to look at aviation as something that's going to deliver in the future. Well, actually, aviation and airlines are delivering that today, as are the manufacturers. And we flew a 737 transatlantic on reusable household waste as part of a sustainable aviation fuel. Of course, the key here now is we need to move into mass production. It's a bit like organic vegetables for me. If something is good for the planet, then it should cost less than something that's bad for the planet. And we need government to start to kickstart the ability for investors to come in and start that investment so the airlines can operate uh, commercially using sustainable aviation fuel. Another area that we're looking at, and th this isn't sustainable aviation fuel is not a silver bullet and it's not a one size fits all for aviation. As a regional airport group, we believe that both hydrogen and electric can become a key player in some of the route networks that we operate from our airport. So in 2023, we are expecting uh, to see the first hydrogen trial from Logan Air, one of our partner uh, airlines to operate from uh, the Highlands in Scotland. And we are uh, again working with them and how we can support them on that. And then lastly, only a week or so ago, we uh, announced two MOUs with eVTOL uh, aircraft, electrical vertical takeoff and landing uh, aircraft. And we believe that by 2024, we'll see eVTOL aircraft operating at our airports. So there's, a, there's many areas in which we are playing a key contributory part. But more importantly, these aren't things of the future. These are things that we'll see within months rather than years or decades. That's great. And I know uh, Jonathan and Dan and, and Jean are going to share uh, their views on, on the opportunity presented by sustainable aviation fuels. Um, so, so it's great to, to hear your thoughts on that and hydrogen and electric. We are coming to the end of uh, our, our session, Derek. So I suppose I've just maybe got time for, for one one last question. So you've mentioned eVTOL, you've mentioned the work AGS is doing with the NHS and drones. Fast forward 10 years, you know, what, what will... AGS airports look like to a passenger when they, when they step into our terminals? 
Okay, so I, I, I mean, and again, I think this is reality. I don't think this is concept or far fetched. Uh, I think key will be our entire infrastructure will be operating with a uh, renewable energy. Uh, we do that today, but we look forward to actually generating our own energy. And we believe that within 10 years, we will be generating all of the energy that's required for our airports and to support air aircraft coming to the airport uh, by both solar and wind. I think that people will arrive in their electric vehicles. They'll be able to park in our car parks at reduced rates and they'll be able to charge from our generated solar and wind powered uh, electricity. With regards to eVTOL, I think there's a new uh, position in the market for eVTOL. And I can see now where people in Scotland who may look to travel to Perth for a business meeting, that would normally mean they arrive in Glasgow at eight, half past eight in the morning. They've got an hour and a half drive for an hour's meeting, an hour and a half back, and then catch a flight to get them back into London for six, seven or eight o'clock at night, can now take an eVTOL aircraft in 10 years time and much sooner than that from our airport, get to their meeting and be back on the 12 o'clock or one o'clock flight. And we know that time is money for most businesses moving forward. So as I say, this is not a, a leap into the future. This is technology that exists today that we believe we'll have in place well within the next three to four years. Thank you, Derek. That's great. I think everyone will agree that the, the pace of change over the past 10 years has been absolutely remarkable. And, and whilst the, the EV toll sounds a bit like the Jetsons, uh, as you say, um, they, they'll be operating from our airports sooner rather than later. Derek, thank you very much for that. That was great. I uh, really enjoyed that. Um, and it's now time to move on and welcome our next speaker. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Council. Jonathan is a group head of sustainability for IAG. He is a master's graduate in mechanical engineering from Imperial College London and an MBA from INSEAD, Fontainebleau, France. In August 2019, he was elected as the chair of the newly formed IATA Sustainability and Environment Advisory Council. In November 2020, he became chair of the UK government's Jet Zero Council Sustainable Aviation Fuel Delivery Group, enabling the UK to become the global leader in the development of sustainable fuels. Jonathan, over to you. Thank you, Brian, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. And it's uh, great to be able to join you today. Um, I'm actually speaking uh, from Glasgow. I arrived at COP26 this morning, and, uh, and it, uh, this is my sixth COP. And I have to say, if you could measure success in energy and excitement, you'd get a, you know, have a lot more confidence that we can address this climate change challenge. So uh, lots going on here. But uh, yeah, what I'm going to do today is just give an overview of the aviation strategy to address uh, climate change uh, with a particular focus, as Brian says, on uh, sustainable aviation fuels. And I'm going to talk specifically about the, the actions of a UK group called Sustainable Aviation. It's uh, probably the world's leading collaboration on all things to do with sustainability in our sector. Um, over 40 members, as you can see, all the, all the key members, including AGS um, in UK aviation, uh, set up in 2005, um, and I'm happy to say we were the first national uh, aviation collaboration to commit to net zero emissions by 2050, and we did this in uh, February last year. And uh, what I want to talk about is some of the activities that have taken place, because now that we've committed to that target, the challenge is to uh, determine how we're going to deliver it. So in the industry, we always talk about a four pillar strategy. We talk about operational efficiency, infrastructure, uh, including air traffic control, market based measures. So things like the EU emissions trading scheme and the global scheme course here. And then importantly, technology and specifically sustainable aviation fuels. So I'm just going to give a minute on the first three pillars and then I'm going to really focus the rest of the presentation on sustainable aviation fuels. Let me talk about operational procedures. So this is a, a speeded up turnaround of an aircraft. So at, uh, at uh, one of our airlines, uh, British Airways, we have a dedicated team looking uh, constantly how we can improve the operational efficiency, like taking weight off the aircraft, making sure that we single use taxi, uh, minimizing the use of the APU. We have over 100 dedicated projects, um, but always constantly looking for ways to reduce just our fuel burn on a day to day basis. And altogether across the group, we save about 100,000 tonnes 
of carbon dioxide just through each of these uh, um, uh, small initiatives which do add up. But one of the big opportunities for aviation is air traffic control. This is um, a speeded up view of the busiest day, busiest day in 2019. So tens of thousands of flights, almost 50,000 flights fly out of the UK. Um, but what you notice, this, this, this uh, system was designed in the 1950s and it's got a lot of inefficiency. So those, those circle sort of um, oblong shape, they're, they're the stacks over Heathrow and the other London airports. And they represent wasted fuel and additional carbon emissions. So one of the big opportunities for us is to modernize airspace. So you have the single European skies project, and there's also a drive to do that uh, within the UK. And we believe that just by moving to best practice air traffic management, we could reduce emissions by 10%. And across Europe, that represents 18 million tons of CO2 a year. So there's a big prize there, and we're constantly focused on how, how we can deliver that. Uh, and then I'm just going to talk a little bit about market-based measures. I haven't got any um, exciting videos to describe market-based measures. So instead, I've just got this landing of an A3, uh, A3 A318 at uh, London City Airport. But yeah, the two main market-based measures that we um, currently um, comply to are the EU emissions trading scheme. So aviation has been part of that since 2012, covers about 40% of our emissions, so all our intra-European emissions. And then our global emissions are covered by the ICAO Corsia scheme, the carbon offsetting and reduction scheme for international aviation. And uh, and uh, that's basically to enable us to deliver carbon neutral growth. It was 2020. It's now baseline to 2019. So as we start to grow, Corsia will cover the growth in all of those emissions. So they're the sort of uh, first three pillars. But I say the, the area that I really want to focus on is sustainable aviation fuels. This is an area where we've seen very significant momentum in the last two to three years. And this chart, I think, explains why as an industry, we've got such a key focus. So across the top, we have the timeline, and then down the, down the left-hand side, we have the, the mission, if you like, in terms of the length of the flight from commute and regional up to short, medium, long haul. And this, this chart tells us two things. First, SAF, Sustainable Aviation Fuels, is the only real opportunity that we have to decarbonize in the near term, in the next five to 10 years. But equally importantly, if you look at medium haul and long haul, these and these two alone represent over 70% of our emissions. They, it really is the only viable solution, even going up to 2050. So therefore, you know, a significant proportion of our decarbonisation plans will depend directly on the deployment of sustainable aviation fuels. And you know, we have been working on this for, for or over 10 years, so we're not, we're not uh, starting from zero. And you can see um, over 370,000 flights have flown on sustainable aviation fuels. We do have supply into the industry. It's a relatively small proportion, but it is available. Uh, we have a number of countries, 36 countries that have SAF policies. We have seven different pathways. They, they, they vary in how much um, uh, CO2 they reduce from 60 to 100%. And we have a lot of um, uh, financial commitment in terms of offtake agreements. So SAF is happening, but the challenge is we nearly, really need to ramp it up in the next 10 years. These are the, the companies that are currently uh, producing SAF around the world. So there's some 20 companies. And, uh, and what we'll see, there are plans for a significant um, uh, increase in the number of plants, which I'll go through. Now, one of the things we, we kind of live by um, carbon roadmaps um, in aviation. And what I've done is just three examples. We have the global roadmap, as produced by ATAG, the Waypoint 2050. We have the European roadmap, that's that fourth bar there, Destination 2050. And then we have the UK roadmap, Sustainable Aviation. The green bit represents the role that sustainable aviation fuels will play in helping us reduce our emissions. And you can see it's very significant from 71% in the highest case. Uh, I'd have to say with sustainable aviation, that 20%, that was based on analysis done about five years ago if we and the next 12 months we're going to update that and my my guess is that will come in nearer 50 percent so we all we're all in the place where we believe they will be the primary opportunity for us to reduce our carbon emissions and i think this chart what i've done here is just try to highlight where the latest targets are at now the top one so we did that that was the commitment we made in 2017 and in 2017 the 32 percent by 2050 was the most ambitious SAF target in the um, uh, in the world. Today, four years later, it is the least ambitious, which is a, thing, a good measure of how fast things are moving. So you can see there's a lot of convergence 
most areas are now looking at least 50% by 2050, if not more. And, um, and I guess equally importantly, 10%, 10 to 15% between now and 2030. And I'll talk a bit about what that means for our industry. Um, so we've seen, um, and again, commitments um, um, from the One World Alliance, which represents 20% uh, of global aviation. So they've committed to 10% aviation fuels by 2030, as also has the World Economics uh, Forum Clean Skies for Tomorrow, where there are, again, over 20 airline partners within that consortium. And this is just a, um, a breakdown of what we're seeing in the Sustainable Aviation Roadmap. So you tend to get quite a shallow uh, uh, commencement to the um, uh, uh, rollout of these fuels, but it does build quite quickly. Once you've proven the technology, you do get this pretty fast ramp up. And here in the UK, uh, we believe in the next 10 years, we could actually build and operate 10 sustainable aviation fuel plants producing over a million and a half tonnes of SAF, saving some 3.6 million tonnes of uh, CO2 a year. And you can see uh, the locations, I'm happy to say, there are two earmarked for Scotland, one in St. Fergus and one in Grangemouth, uh, not that far from here. And then across Europe, the latest plans are for uh, 26 uh, SAF plants within the next five years, producing up to 5 million tonnes a year of sustainable aviation fuels. And then in the US, who's probably leading in this area now, I would say there are plans to produce 44 sustainable aviation fuel plants in the next five years. So you can see uh, in, in total, almost 80 plants are, are in the planning phase, so uh, really starting to move. And then the other question we always get, but aren't they too expensive? Um, aren't there, isn't there a price premium? And it's true to, uh, to say today there is a price premium. We believe as we start building these plants, we benefit from the learning scale, uh, the learning curve effect, and also the scale effect. So you can see how rapidly we think. And this is something that's replicated in all new energy industries and renewable industries. So the prices of SAF come down. Of course, our view is as well that the price of jet fuel and when you include the carbon cost will go up. Now, originally, we thought that crossover point was probably the late 2030s. With what we've seen in the last two or three years, we actually think we could get that crossover point to the early 2030s. So the key is get those first of a kind plants built and we'll meet that crossover point where sustainable aviation fuels will become economically self-sustaining in their own right. So the key the key now is, is policy to enable us to attract the investment to build these first of a kind plants and to deliver 10% by 2030. We're going to need about 250 billion dollars of investment and we typically talk about the three elements of policy demand signal price stability mechanism and capital risk support so demand signal so we've seen proposals for mandates in both the eu and the uk so they will provide that demand signal but what we need very importantly is a price stability mechanism we've seen this for other renewable industries so for instance a contracts for difference tool so we're just working closely with the uk government to see what we can implement here in the uk and we think those with some capital risk support through grants and potential loan guarantees, that will unlock the ability to attract the finance to get these first of a kind plants built. And you can see there is already uh, quite a lot of activity around the world, recognizing that now the key to getting these plants built is getting the appropriate policy in place. So you can see there's a lot of activity around the world. And something that we, we've been supportive of here in the UK that has enabled more rapid development of that uh, um, policy moves is the Jet Zero Council. So this was set up um, by the Prime Minister um, and the Secretary of State for Transport and Bays um, 12 months ago. And in the last 12 months, we've seen some pretty rapid um, progress. Uh, normally, it takes three or four years to get some policy consultations. We've seen two in 12 months, so the Jet Zero consultation and importantly, the SAF mandate consultation. And that, I think, is a, a directly... Um, due to the, 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 the uh, partnership that has been arranged through the Jet Zero Council. So we at IG, we committed to 10% sustainable aviation fuel. So for us as a company, that's 1 million tonnes by 2030. We think with that right policy move, this is achievable. And we think this is a target that should be set globally. Globally, that means that will mean uh, uh, 30 million tonnes of sustainable aviation fuels, saving some 70 million tonnes of carbon dioxide a year, employing some 300,000 people. So it is a big move from where we are today. But as I say, if we get the right policy in place, we think it is eminently achievable. Um, so what I'm doing now is just talk about a couple of our projects. Our flagship project is a company called Velocis. This is a plant that we're going to build 
in South Humberside. It takes 500,000 tonnes of regular waste a year and it converts it into uh, sustainable jet fuel, 100,000 tonnes a year of sustainable jet fuel. And we believe there's a potential to build at least half a dozen of these uh, around the UK. So we see it as a key early opportunity. Um, and then we have other projects. We have a project with a company called Lanzajet in uh, the United States. We have a second project uh, with Velocis that um, interestingly employs carbon capture technology. And we've also got some um, early stage projects uh, elsewhere uh, within the UK. So a lot of activity happening um, uh, around the patch. And then just um, uh, before I conclude, uh, to help sort of prove the concept, all of British Airways flights uh, up to the COP from Heathrow, Glasgow, uh, sorry, Heathrow, Gatwick and London City Airport. So some 140 flights have all been powered on 100% equivalent SAF. And uh, just coincidentally, when I flew up to Glasgow this morning, I actually flew up on this uh, on this aircraft, which is the newly, which is the um, newly liveried aircraft reflecting BA's new sustainability strategy. Um, and then just just um, so that's all on sustainable aviation fuels and just just coming out more broadly. I mean, um, very excitingly, um, uh, aviation committed to net zero emissions at the IATA AGM just uh, just a month ago. And we now are the first global industry to commit to net zero emissions by 2050. And I think that that is a major milestone for our industry. And that is going to help us not only accelerate sustainable aviation fuels, but those other technologies that are going to help us meet that net zero ambition. And then specifically at the COP, one of the primary objectives for us is uh, to build momentum for the ICAO General Assembly. So there are no formal negotiations directly related to aviation here at the COP because they are managed by ICAO. But next year we have a General Assembly. These happen every three years. So the COP is really important to help build uh, momentum for that. And tomorrow you'll hear um, the, the government announce an international coalition to try and build this momentum for the COP. And the three things that we're looking for Commitment to net zero emissions by all governments of the world for aviation, a strengthening of our global market-based measure scheme, Corsia, and also ambition for sustainable aviation fuels to accelerate global supply. So that's uh, that's all from me. And um, yeah, hope that uh, makes sense. I'm happy to take any questions. That's great, Jonathan. Thanks very much. I mean, I think uh, it's great to see how how rapidly. SAF has developed over the past 10 years and you know to be able to articulate as you did the, the potential uh, in helping the industry achieve net zero. Now where you were presenting there was a poll uh, we asked everyone what percentage volume of SAF should the global airline industry commit to by 2030. You see the results are in so uh, nobody uh, opted for two percent nobody opted for five percent 25 percent of people said that the um, industry should commit to 10 percent and then there was an even split between 15% and more than 15%, with 38% of uh, all those who cast the vote saying we should uh, go for 15, and another 38% saying we should go for for more. So good to see, just like you and IHE, our uh, our uh, guests are, are quite ambitious. Can I take you back to the IAG um, target? You, you've you've got that target of 10% SAF by 2030. What what needs to happen to make that a reality, Jonathan? You yeah, know, thanks, Brian. Yeah, and it's great to see that ambition. Um, I mean, uh, uh, we we calculate ten percent based on what we know today, but I think you know it would be love uh, great to be able to get to the fifteen percent. But yeah, no, thank you for the poll results there. Now, the, and the critical the critical piece for us is the policy. So as so say, we we need to attract uh, globally two hundred and fifty billion dollars of capital. You know, and I spent a lot of the last ten years talking to our investors, and they're saying, you know, we need these three elements. We need that demand signal. And, you know, the mandates are going to meet that. But the bit that we're missing at the moment is what they call this price stability mechanism. So th th that and that was the thing that enabled the development of the renewable, uh, the wind power industry here in the UK. So we are working closely with the government to look at that for sustainable aviation fuels. And I'm reasonably confident that if we get that in place next year, we're going to start to see that capital flow and get those first of a kind plants built. That's great, John. So for you, that that is that is the biggest hurdle that we need to overcome as an industry between now and a KO next year. And yeah. I think you're right to draw the parallel between SAF and where the renewables uh, sector was some 20 years ago, and that has since obviously grown exponentially. So um, thank you for that, Jonathan. That was really helpful uh, overview. Um, and you. you know, thank good you. luck tomorrow, and we look forward to the announcement. And I'd like mm -hmm. to introduce our next speaker. Um, Dan Williams. Uh, Dan, uh, uh, 
sorry, two seconds, is the Senior International Advisor of the FAA's Office of Environment and Energy. And that's where Dan coordinates all the FAA, FAA's international environmental activities uh, at ICAO's Committee on Aviation Environmental Protection. Dan's also the lead advisor on policy and technical matters related to ICAO's carbon offsetting and reduction scheme for international aviation, Corsia. So Dan, uh, welcome, and if I can hand over to you. You can. Um, thanks so much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see Jonathan and follow him, although if I had known he was going to have really cool videos in his slides, um, I would have chosen to go before him <laughs> to the extent that choice existed. Um, but that was a really great uh, lead in uh, and Derek for him. Um, so we know who I am. We know what I'm doing here. Uh, let's talk about what we're doing in the United States um, on SAP. Um, there we go. Um, so I think in a way that, that Jonathan did, I think it helps to sort of start on, on one level above talking about just SAF and, and sort of looking at our approach to addressing climate change is really a holistic one. Um, we don't, you know, like, like others, we don't think there's a silver bullet. And so we have a very broad portfolio of efforts. Um, you know, today we're going to look only at the column here on, on SAF, but I think it's really worth pointing out, um, the efforts that we do working with OEMs and with airlines and with others, airports, um, et cetera, to accelerate the development of technologies and engines and airframes. Um, you know, those increase the efficiency, they reduce the fuel burn and, and sort of like Jonathan showed in this video, um, to the extent that we can improve um, the flight operations as well, you know, as we, op as we optimize the procedures to reduce fuel burn, um, neither of those directly relate to the development and deployment of SAF, but they do reduce um, the overall need for fuel and they reduce the fuel burn. And so, you know, in a way you're helping SAF by, um, you know, reducing the amount you actually need to, to end up achieving your goals. Um, and again, you know, I feel like I'm just repeating everything Jonathan said um, to round out that, that basket of measures, the, the policy option space, um, you need, you know, the smart policies, not just, the international ones like I deal with every day, but also the domestic policies, um, you know, that address costs, that address those supply chains issues um, so that the fuels and the technologies and everything can make their way into the aircraft um, and sort of get us to where we need to be. So, um, but like, like we said, this panel is about staff and that's really the focus here. And so, you know, I think it helps at the, at the outset to sort of say, why SAF? You know, why aren't we talking? Why don't we have a panel on, you know, other fuel options, other sort of uh, magical solutions that are out there? Um, I, I sort of came up with seven reasons. Um, I'm sure there's others, uh, but, you know, the seven that, that I have and the ones that we sort of hear the most, I think, uh, in our office from our stakeholders, uh, these are drop-in fuels. Uh, and I think, you know, it can't be overstated how important that aspect of SAF is. Uh, any other fuel source um, that you're adding to aircraft is going to need infrastructure on the ground. It's going to need technologies on the aircraft that just aren't there now. Um, as Jonathan just said, SAF is already expensive. Uh, it already has, you know, those sort of built-in challenges. And you just imagining if that cost included new pipelines, new fuel tanks, new engines, you know, a new hydrant system or whatever, um, you've all of a sudden gone from something that's pretty viable to something that's kind of more of in the area of wishful thinking. Um, so that's that's really, you know, I think the one that really put a star by that one. Um, also, you know, just when you think about aviation, we need significant reductions if we're serious about decarbonization. And SAF, if produced correctly, is really one of those few areas where you have, um, that's really gonna yield significant benefits in the near term. Um, uh, I think, you know, we, we talk a lot about the importance of technology and what those are going to mean for the long term. But in order to sort of get to those, to bridge that gap, you need something in the near term. And then even as you get those technologies to market, you're going to need um, the fuels to, to power those technologies. Um, again, technologies, they exist. They're out there. Um, I think Jonathan said that there's already these seven approved pathways for the creation. Um, and I think... Uh, as we focus more and more effort, more and more R&D in this area, we're going to have more pathways approved. We're going to unlock more supply. Um, and those two lines that Jonathan had us intersecting in the 2030s, maybe we'll do it sooner. Um, 
and that's sort of tied to the next point, which is that it's scalable. As we get these new pathways, we open the speed stocks, um, there's more low carbon options. Um, yeah, it is loud in here. Sorry about that. Um, you know, if, if we have a, a global solution that works in Canada and global solution that works in Brazil, right, we're, we've got sort of the plant covered for options for operators um, to sort of do what we need to do uh, as an industry to decarbonize. Um, airlines are accepting staff. Um, they're broadly supported in the United States by our federal agencies as well. Um, it, anybody who's familiar with U.S. politics knows it's not always um, everybody getting along. Um, but this is why area where, uh, strangely, everybody seems to get along um, because of the benefits that you see from, you know, from some on the climate side and you see from others on the rural economic development. Um, and it creates this stable energy supply that's domestic. And that's the sort of thing that um, everybody's interested in in the U.S. Um, and I think, you know, I, I touched on this in a couple of points, but this is really key internationally um, to address aviation emissions, right? SAF is something that you can produce basically anywhere. And so, you know, you may not have opportunities for technology, you know, for the operational, the infrastructure, you, you may not have those in every country. Um, but you do have the sort of feedstocks, generally speaking, wherever you are, um, that can really help you help your airlines sort of drive down the carbon emissions from the sector. And I think that that's key as well. So moving on, um, I said I'd talk about the US and I just gave you a lot of information about SAF, but now I'm gonna talk about the US stuff. Um, so specifically, you know, what are we doing? I get this question a lot. I used to get this question a lot um, during the previous administration uh, and it was a lot harder to answer. Um, it's a lot easier to answer now because it seems like we're doing everything. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the Biden-Harris administration has really uh, focused on climate in a way that I don't, I'm not sure that I've ever seen, uh, and I've been working at the FAA since 2014. Um, it's really an all of the above approach. Uh, it's a, it's a um, take a look at everything and see what we can do. Um, and I think that, you know, honestly, that that's great and it's exciting and it's, um, you know, for my office in particular, but for the FAA as a whole, I think it's very fascinating to see um, this sort of all of, an, all of the above and really a government focus on sectors that I think haven't been focused on so heavily before. Um, I know other folks elsewhere in DOT who work on shipping also sort of have this renewed vigor that I don't think that they've ever had in their time, probably in government, sort of similar to the way we are in aviation. And so it's really, it's really fascinating from a U.S. standpoint. I know we've always sort of called ourselves a leader, but I think um, looking at, at least from the inside, at what we're doing now, we're truly um, in a place we haven't been before. Um, so all of, all of the focus that we've had, all of the stuff we've been doing, um, sort of culminated uh, in September with the sustainable aviation Roundtable at the white house. Um, it was a bunch of announcements. It was, a you know, we, we gathered a bunch of federal agencies, FAA was there, um, our larger sort of parent organization, the department of transportation was there, the department of energies, department of agriculture, EPA, probably others. Um, it also included industry. We had fuel producers there. We had airlines, we had airports. Um, and there's just a series of announcements, you know, that sort of laid out uh, and sort of mentioned all the, the technology and everything that we covered. Um, but I think really the headline grabbers ones were the ones related to the fuels. Um, the announcement of the S Sustainable Aviation Fuel Grand Challenge um, is something that we had been working on a long time at FAA with others. Um, and I think the other sort of real key one from our office is a lot of these funding opportunities to support um, sustainable aviation fuel projects. Um, that's a that's a big thing in our office. Uh, we fund a lot of university research and a lot of public private partnerships. And so that that kind of dollar amounts really, I think, speaks a lot to the commitment of of the government doing you know what it is we need to get done. Um, so looking specifically at the grand challenge um, from a fuel standpoint, I think this is really the big one. Um, it's a government wide effort to reduce the cost, enhance the sustainability, and expand the production and use of SAF uh, with really a goal of meeting 100% of aviation fuel demand by 2050. Um, that, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot in the US. It's a really ambitious goal. Um, I think the challenge also makes 
it, it really highlights that, that SAF is a key priority in our broader set of actions um, from our government and, fr and from the private sector. Um, I mentioned they were there and, you know, you heard from Jonathan, they're committed. He's not a U.S. airline, but um, part of One World American Airlines, um, you know, from from the other, you know, we got United, all, all of Delta, all of the major operators are, you know, focused on this. They're working with us on this and that's huge. Um, but you know, it's a it's a commitment to reduce the um, the sector's emissions in a manner consistent with the goal of net zero emissions for our economy, which is our economy wide goal, um, and then to put avi the avi the aviation sector in the United States on a pathway to full decarbonization as well by 2050. Um, I think the challenge, you know, thinking about it, also makes clear that there is really a commitment um, in a way that we had sort of um, played played fiddle to, but I think it made serious when you start throwing out dollar amounts that they that they want to do that. And then I think my next slide is about the the MOU that we have um, between the agencies. But I think the fact that it's you know a written agreement between our agencies, which don't always get along, um, but to really to commit our resources to combine on the research, the development, and the deployment um, is really a huge key. And so sort of looking at the roles there, um, you know, for the various agencies. Uh, I think you sort of have what you would probably think if you gave it a minute to think about who's doing what. Um, you know, in essence, the energy department is focused on the technologies that are gonna enable the production. They're gonna sort of work with the refining and sort of looking for the new pathways. And this includes things like co-processing at existing facilities, um, you know, to increase the supply and to sort of build on efficiencies that are already out there. Um, from the FAA side, so my people, uh, we are responsible for really an overall strategy to decarbonize aviation. Um, we have the expertise on the SAF testing and analysis. We have those folks. Um, we also take part in the ASTM process, which is you know what enables those pathways to be approved for use. Um, and we also have the team that works at ICAO to ensure the global standards are there um, for SAF um, so that we can sort of internationally do what needs to be done. And then from the USDA, that's our Department of Agriculture, um, right? They really have a broad portfolio of responsibilities. Um, there, I would, I would, I would refer to them as the boots on the ground, really, because they're working with, you know, either the farmers uh, if for the sort of biofeedstocks, or with the other producers, you know, for the waste and, and the sort of residues, um, working with them to sort of do the education and get the technologies out there um, to make sure that that all this half happens. And so finally, I think I got one more slide. There we go. Uh, I just want to wrap it up and then hand it back because uh, I'm interested to hear what others uh, always have to say on these panels too. Um, just want to highlight, we really are taking a holistic approach to aviation. Um, I talked about SAF here, but I could have gone another couple hours talking about everything else that we're doing, you know, across technology and operations. Um, Jonathan said it and I'll reiterate it. SAF is critical to this effort now. It's critical to this effort in the future. Um, it provides reductions that we're just not going to find elsewhere. Um, and the U.S. government, uh, alongside our stakeholders, we're really committed to this effort. Um, through the grand challenge, we're going to scale up that production. Um, our goal, our initial goal is 3 billion gallons a year by 2030. Uh, I don't know what that is in liters. I should have converted it before I gave this talk, but um, there you go. There's our weird American measurement system. Um, and we really do think we can meet all of jet fuel demand by 2050. Um, they're ambitious goals, and I think they reflect the seriousness of the crisis. Our government is committed, our industry is supportive, and I think now is the time to turn those goals into actions. And so with that, uh, I will stop and That's great. we'll see what's next. <laughs> Brilliant, and thanks very much for that. I mean, of I have course. to say, yeah, and sitting here in Glasgow in the UK, I think looking on with some envy at the progress that, that you seem to be making in the States on SAF, um, it seems to be, you know, there's certainly the ambition there uh, from from government, and that's translating through to the confidence levels, I suppose, in the private sector. We do have a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, we've got one from Terry, and I think that maybe ties back to your um, reference to the holistic approach. Terry wants to know, are there any airline or airport technology innovations coming into use for the future supply of SAF? Yeah, I mean, from an airline standpoint, that's one. Um, I don't like to speak for our stakeholders because uh, I know they get angry when I do. And, you know, if they try to set policy through what they say, that that sort of causes us concern. So um, in terms of like actual airline, what they're doing with technologies, I would 
refer to Jonathan and others uh, on, on what they're sort of incorporating. Um, I know that from an airport, I'm not sure that there's necessarily technologies, but I know that they are very interested in how they can sort of help enable the supply at the airport. Um, I think that's the most critical piece really is getting um, the fuel that's made and produced, right? It, it's that the sort of all we hear about in the United States now is supply chains and getting stuff into ports or whatever. Um, but being able to actually get the fuels produced into the airports and get them stored and into the aircraft, um, I think that's going to be key. And I know for, for operators who are trying to sort of quantify those reductions and take credit for them, whether it's in Corsia or through um, like the California low carbon fuel standard, and I'm sure this is similar in Europe, you know, you need to be able to track that fuel and know that you're getting it. And so I think some of the technology we're going to need from airports is the um, maybe a different ability to work with operators to ensure that that tracking can be done accurately. That's great. Dan. Thanks. I mean, certainly working for an airport operator, we, we don't need to do anything to our infrastructure <laughs> at the moment. And, and that's probably that's the most appealing thing now of all the exactly. um, of all the all the uh, options available to decarbonize aviation. SAF is there. We know it works. We just need to address the scalability and the price piece. We've got one, yep. one more question and we'll have to leave it there, Dan. Uh, coming in from David. What's the biggest challenge facing SAF? Uh, that's yeah, that's actually one of the easier questions, right? The biggest challenge facing is the economics. Um, I, I mean, I think everybody on this panel would agree with it, right? Once you once you reduce the price premium, maybe you don't even have to eliminate it because of the other benefits you get from SAF. But once you reduce it to a point, um, I think it's not a question that people are going to take it. Um, but the issue is how expensive it is and how that fits into, you know, airlines want to do their part, but fuel is a huge cost. You can't, you can't increase that cost, you know, exponentially and expect airlines to be able to survive even as much as they want to deal with the climate crisis. Um, and so I think, you know, all the things that we've mentioned in, in the first few presentations, you know, sort of that scalability, enabling additional feedstock and sort of having a bigger pot to choose from is going to drive the cost down and that's going to make the economics palatable. That's great. Thank you, Dan. I mean, I think I, I uh, at the weekend watched Back to the Future with my four-year-old son. <laughs> we saw that scene with the dock pouring the rubbish and the beer cans into the back of the DeLorean. And whenever you describe it like in that way to people and, and the passengers, <laughs> everyone's in violent agreement. This is what this is something we should be doing. This is something we should be pursuing. You can turn waste and uh, uh, turn into jet fuel and decarbonize. So yeah, fingers crossed that uh, we, we we see it getting scaled up, but. Thank you, Dan. That, that was excellent. Uh, we'll now move on to our next speaker. Um, our next speaker, he's played a pioneering and leading role in building today's $136 billion global biofuels industry since 1996. In 1998, he launched World Energy to drive positive change by accelerating the commercialization of viable alternatives to fossil motor fuels. He holds a master's in public administration from Harvard University and bachelor of Sciences, uh, science degrees in economics and business management from the Ohio State University. He's also the founding chairman of the National Biodiesel Political Action Committee and founding member of the Biodiesel Quality Accreditation Committee. Jean Gaboles is the Chief Executive of World Energy. Welcome, Jean. Well, thanks very much. It's, it's fantastic to be here. I too am in Glasgow and, uh, and it's uh, just been an incredible uh, couple of days, even in the, in the presentations that have uh, gone before me, you can just really feel the intensity and urgency of, uh, of folks here. I just wrote down a couple of words that, uh, of, of kind of observation. I wrote down sincerity, authenticity, ambition, uh, I am just really struck by being in this environment in which there is so much commitment to progress. Uh, so I, I, I will start with a couple of questions um, that I've, I've started um, some talks with before, and um, maybe folks can just put it in the chat or in whatever, uh, in whatever vehicle. But um, I'll start with a couple of thought questions. Uh, 1850, uh, what do folks think was the life expectancy of a human being? Give me a second. Put, yeah, they can all put their put your answers into the uh, the comments section on the right. 
Uh, the answer. We've got Jonathan at uh, 40. Jonathan hit the number right on the nose. <laughs> <laughs> right on the nose. Okay, I've got one more. So the average life expectancy in 1850 was 40 years old. So I'm 57. Uh, I'd, I'd have been 17 years in the grave. Uh, second question. How much of the world's population lived in poverty? I'll, I'll give you the answer. Yeah, oh, Jonathan's out there early too. Uh, the, the answer is about half. Wow. So pre-industrial revolution, you had a 50-50 chance of living in poverty and your life was likely to be over uh, by the time you're 41. The world has progressed so far since then and it's because of fossil fuels. So we now live twice as long, fewer than one in 10 of us live in poverty. The human experience has just been absolutely elevated by fossil fuels. We have to understand that we're not just going to get rid of fossil fuels. We're going to have to replace liquid fuels with lower carbon, better fuels. And so, uh, I Let's see, how do I hit next? It's not going to next for me, so I might just, uh, Brian, did you have uh, the ability to, there we go. Oh, let's see. happening now. Yeah, let's see. Hmm. Nope, under fire. L little technology uh, difficulty here, sorry about that. Uh, I'm hitting next on my computer, but it's not going anywhere. Yeah, no, that's right. I don't have control of it, Gene, but maybe one of the team can help. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, I'll just carry on. Uh, uh, the, um, let's see. Next, next, next. Okay. So um, uh, the challenge, and, and, and so I, I just want to share with everybody that in the introduction was probably too long, but the, but the point here has been um, we've been, uh, World Energy, we've been trying to get in front of things for a very long time. For uh, We've been doing things before they're obvious for 25 years. This one, pulling the plug uh, on, on uh, uh, fossil fuels while continuing to improve uh, the human experience is going to require uh, an effort like we've never had on, on planet Earth before. This one is the biggest conundrum uh, we can imagine. Companies, private companies, need to continue to grow. That's the way markets work and how capitalism works. But they have to shrink at the same time. And, th and this is such a difficult challenge. And I, I, if it uh, looks like you guys have figured out how to control to go next, if we can just go to the next one. Thank you very much. Um, it is putting a huge... Uh, burden on on private companies. I would say uh, I was interested in in um, the, the Dan's uh, presentation about the change he's feeling in the U.S. I would say that the the biggest change um, to the advancement of uh, of uh, alternative fuels, low carbon alternatives in the U.S. Uh, occurred on the second Tuesday of November, 2016. So in the US, we elected a president who had been outright hostile to the idea that we were going to have to work to reduce carbon. And so that put an enormous uh, pressure on subnational uh, actors, uh, in particular corporations. There was not one major net zero commitment from a corporation before the second Tuesday, that's election day in November of 2016. But then the, then the burden of how do we, how do we move forward shifted from national actors to, to uh, individual corporate actors. And I would argue that that has done more positive for the, the, the work going forward um, than, than I certainly would have imagined back 
uh, in 2016. So everything has shifted uh, in terms of what a, a corporation has to think about. Every corporation faces its customers and, and with the overwhelming view of, of the public that we need to move forward in the face of a, na the, a major nation, arguably the most important nation on planet Earth going nowhere, corporations had to move to the, to the fore. Uh, increasingly young people uh, uh, care where they work. Uh, the, the idea that they, they're going to just go and make a living uh, for the most talented people, uh, that's, that's not the, the, the core value anymore. The core value is, is, is to make an impact, have life have meaning, uh, have a day's work go into something that they believe in. And so all of business has to get the best talent. And to get the best talent, you can't ignore the biggest problem on, on, on the planet. Customers care. And so this has become a private industry problem that is really substantial. And there's no hiding uh, as of, of uh, as of 26, late 2016, there was no hiding thinking, OK, we'll follow policy whenever policy comes. And so this pushed uh, private actors to the fore. If we could go to the next slide. Um, uh, it, that really pushed that was at the that was at the forefront of what caused this is just just private actors in in uh, in the in aviation that have come out with net zero commitments. Uh, if we can go to the next one, we can actually see what they've committed to. Uh, and th these were these were immense moonshot ambitions, one after another after another. And we've been hearing about them for uh, you know a lot more ambitious moonshots for uh, for. 10 days now here in Glasgow and, and, and more like a couple somehow ever since COVID uh, hit all these commitments really uh, got accelerated. And so uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Um, and so what are the uh, private, private companies going to do with, with these huge commitments? We've been hearing even in this panel, if we could move to the next slide, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, uh, even in this panel, we've been hearing about the emphasis on on SAF and how important SAF is. Well, uh, I'm not sure if you're able to move the slide, but if you are, that that would there you go. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, in the face of these uh, of these net zero commitments, as companies continue to grow, uh, Amazon grew by uh, by 13 uh, percent. Expects to grow by 13 percent over over the next 10 years. This puts more and more pressure on this growing uh, while shrinking uh, conundrum. Uh, next slide, slide please. Uh, and as you can see from their results, it's gonna be a very, very difficult challenge uh, uh, for them to continue to grow and for all growing companies to, to continue to grow uh, as, as they shrink. Let's go to the next, next one, please. Um, Aviation, uh, transportation is a huge piece of the of the of the puzzle. These are again U.S. Uh, focused uh, uh, slides, but they show the importance of transportation overall. It's the leading uh, emissions sector in the U.S., uh, and and aviation is going to be the most difficult piece uh, to to address. Next slide, please. Um, and so it's going to take, you know, what's, what's this going to take? This is going to take uh, getting in front. Uh, it's going to take taking big risk. Uh, our company has been doing that for a long time. Uh, we, were, we, we started off in the biodiesel industry before there was such a thing. Uh, we innovated all along the way. In 20, early 2018, we purchased the first uh, uh, SAF producer in the world in in. Uh, Paramount, California, which is in LA. Uh, that's still the only U.S. Pro commercial producer of SAF. Uh, we're now working on, uh, next slide, please. We're now working on uh, our second facility, uh, uh, which is likely to be in the American South, and then the third facility, which is likely to be in the American East. Uh, clearly, uh, what's happening here on this side of the Atlantic is super important. But, but we can build plants everywhere. And as Dan referenced, there is a lot of infrastructure that exists today. The key here is going to be to be going on beyond the obvious. 
Um, innovation is going to be the key. Dan was asked uh, what was the biggest uh, challenge, and he he said that the biggest challenge was economics. Well, the biggest challenge to economics is feedstock, and we're going to have to address. There's a lot we can do within existing feedstock, all the way back to the farmer, uh, in it, the way the farmer uh, tills his field, the the way the uh, bean gets to the crush, the way that the crush gets to the uh, uh, a place where production can happen. And I use I use the uh, uh, example of a soybean uh, because soybeans are going to be important. Most of what we make. We make out of animal fat and use cooking oil today, but there's just not enough animal fat and use cooking oil to get to where we need to get to. We need to build this industry on fats, oils, and greases because that's what we can do today. And we can't wait till there's a perfect solution tomorrow. We have to work on the perfect solution for tomorrow while we're using the imperfect solutions of today. And so uh, despite the fact that we don't use very much soybean oil in, 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 in our uh, production process. We use the lowest carbon intensity feedstocks possible and we'll continue to do so. But to scale, we really need everything under the sun and there's a lot we can do. We can, we can get to about four times as much feedstock as we currently have with the current feedstocks. There's gonna be growth all over the world in, in, in all of the, the base fats, oils and greases. And so, it's going to be fats, oils, and greases that get us from here to 2030. And there, that we, we need to recognize that. But from 2030 on, we have to be in all new feedstocks. So we need to do the innovation now to get to the place where we can continue to grow this industry. All the announcements and commitments in the world are fantastic, but they don't make products. So I have to go, when I leave Glasgow, I have to go back uh, to Boston, where we're based, and focus on the production at our plants uh, in in Los Angeles, in Houston, in Natchez, Mississippi, in Rome, Georgia, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, in Hamilton, Ontario. We need to focus every day on taking actual inputs through putting them through, through plants and put it pushing the product out. So we need to do two things at the same time. We need to continue to grow this industry based on what can be done today. There needs to be a growing piece of the pie of feedstock going to aviation and away from ground fuels. That's absolutely critical. We'll be able to decarbonize ground fuels sooner than we'll be able to decarbonize avi aviation. Aviation is going to be the last to go. And so we need to be working on aviation now. But I want to make sure people understand the importance for those of us who have to do all of this stuff and then make a payroll at the end of the week we have to be able to use the viable feedstocks today while we're, we're researching the feedstocks for tomorrow. And there's real promise as, as the cost of those feedstocks have gone up with more demand, the crossover point for other feedstocks become more viable. And so there's some, uh, I think a number of the other uh, speakers have, have talked about some of the feedstocks that are, are, are critical and, uh, there are many. There is still promise in, in, in algae. What we need to be able to do is take, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, what we need to be able to do is do carbon capture by creating all the feedstocks necessary to replace all the aviation fuel on planet Earth above terra firma. That's the best carbon sequestration we can possibly do. Just leave it down there. So how are we going to generate all the feedstocks we need above terra firma? We're looking at all of them. We're not, we're, we're completely uh, technology and feedstock agnostic. Our focus is bringing, is taking the risks, taking, getting on the front ends. We're invested in algae. We're, we're uh, looking at, at, at every other feedstock uh, possible but we have to keep on innovating. We're gonna to, to, to reach the goals and these goals are really important and they're really good signals, but we have to move, be able to move beyond where we are. And, and, and frankly, we're not there yet on most, of the, on, on the most of the next generation feedstocks. And so we're gonna to need to be able to redeploy the progress we make on, on traditional existing feedstocks into the wave of the future. But we can take the sun's energy 
and cause that sun's energy to get converted into feedstocks that we can convert into liquid fuels that can power the planes that require us to stay connected globally. Next slide, please. So it's not only about innovation in the in 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 future feedstocks. There's there's real innovation we can do in expanding yields on existing feedstocks. Um, uh, I think I made the point here about this kind of broad range. I'm not going to go into every one because there's some really promising stuff. And air, you know, direct air capture is really uh, is, is promising. It's extremely early stage and very expensive but we need to be working on it. Uh, uh, um, waste residues, as I had said, um, uh, there's, a, there's a wide range of, of possibilities, but let's, let's be clear, we're going to need to make progress in that area. Next. Yeah, so I think the, 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 the thing I wanna leave you with, and it's, it's really great that large, uh, Oil companies are now trying to are now getting into uh, the sustainable aviation fuel space. There's still only two of us, Neste and World Energy, uh, producing the product today. Obviously, you don't have an industry made of two players. You have to have an industry that's that's broad. But I I want to I want to be super clear about the importance of moving early on innovation. Uh, the market's got to be able to absorb some risk on us taking. Uh, paths that don't work out. Uh, not all not all paths are going to work, and so a big part of reaching all the goals that we've been talking about so far in this panel is going to be about uh, risk diversification and allowing for uh, us to take some to take some paths that uh, that that ultimately don't pan. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll I'll wrap it up. I'm I'm thrilled to be Good. here. I appreciate the, being on uh, this side of the pond and hearing what's happening. Uh, over here and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, making that pond a little smaller and working more closely together on this side. That's great, Gene. Thanks very much. And I, and I think your point's absolutely valid. And we do need to create that space for innovation. You know, that's what it's all about. It's about trial and error and being brave enough to, you know, to, to go out and try things and recognizing they won't always work. We are slightly over. We've got time for just one quick question um, coming in from Neil Pritchard, Gene, you said customers care about sustainability. In aviation terms, do you think, or have airlines tried um, a way for passengers to pay a premium to ensure SAF is a part of every flight? Yeah, so we've worked very closely with a number of airlines, but none more closely uh, than United. United has been with us from the, from the start, um, and, si and United has begun uh, offering a program in which um, the the you can voluntarily pay into a, a, a SAF fuel uh, pool uh, in which they then will redirect that to, to SAF. Um, uh, I was uh, with the, the CEO of United this morning. Um, he had indicated that the, 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 that, that, was, that program was in very early stages. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we're doing some things directly. I think others are looking at how do you bring the customer into the mix of paying for the increment or incremental cost of SAF. Um, I, I think it's very early stage uh, work, but I think it's really important work. Uh, I think we all know that that um, that folks today uh, care. I think here in Glasgow, uh, people care and they're willing to take action, but we need to create the vehicles for people to actually do that. And I think it's early stages, but yes, I, I know United has and others are, are beginning to do that as well. That's great, Gene. Gene, thanks very much. And it's great to see you've been doing your bit for the environment in Glasgow, cycling around here <laughs> in the background. So thanks very much, Gene. That, that was great. And we'll now just move on to our, our last speaker of the afternoon, um, Martin Bowman. Martin is the UK Aviation Director at Deloitte, the multinational provider of audit insurance, consulting, financial advisory, and related services. Martin's clients include Heathrow Airport, NAV Canada and MAG, and his knowledge spans multiple areas, including integrated airport operations, aviation tech trends, and complex system integration. Martin, you're very welcome, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, 
Brian, and, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. And uh, first and foremost, as a, as a Glaswegian, for those of you joining us in our city for COP, and for those of you um, joining us virtually uh, for COP, we, we welcome you and we hope you have a, a very, very productive time uh, in the city. So um, I'm going to talk uh, for a few minutes just about the the deep the the decarbonizing aviation challenge and you know when i was thinking about this talk and preparing for this talk and preparing for for the conference i noted its title and the title carbon is key i actually thought well it's probably a slightly misleading title it should be decarbon is key decarbonization of aviation is the single biggest, most strategic challenge we face in our industry. It is, uh, in many ways, an existential challenge and something which, um, thankfully, uh, there's strong evidence that, that we in the industry are rising to. Uh, could you move to the next slide, please? So um, just to give you a bit of background to to Deloitte and, and what we have been doing within the uh, decarbonisation agenda. We've been uh, conducting a, a series of research into industry sectors uh, that are harder to decarbonise. And here we can see a list of some of those on, on screen just now. Um, we have published some recent research around shipping and freight, and uh, we have some recent research uh, published specifically on aviation. Uh, and I'm going to uh, share with you some insights from that research on aviation. Uh, we, we, I think it's abundantly clear um, that aviation needs to um, really uh, take the decarbonisation agenda seriously. We know, obviously, that, that the industry is, is a significant uh, committer, uh, emitter of, of carbon. Um, and the challenge that lies ahead for us as an industry is the challenge that relates to what happens at, at the pace at which we can de decarbonise uh, compared to other sectors. Um, and if you move to the next slide, please. And I think that, that the point I'm making around the pace of change and the pace of decarbonisation in aviation is illustrated by this particular uh, piece of information on the screen just now. Um, without significant intervention, we will see aviation carbon emissions uh, grow significantly uh, over 2.5 times from the current levels uh, out to 2020, uh, 2050, um, which at a time when other industries are significantly moving in the opposite direction is of uh, great concern to the industry. Um, so we, you can see that we, we currently, if you look at 2019 emission levels, we, we represent circa 3% of global emissions. Um, if the trajectory continues, once once we're onto the recovery uh, trajectory, uh, and we, we start to see the, the growth back in the sector that was in the sector pre-pandemic. Um, by 2050, you could be looking at, without intervention, I must add, and this is very much a worst case scenario, 22% um, of the, the planet's total emissions coming from the aviation sector, which is a rather uh, gloom picture and a rather gloom scenario. Um, uh, but the good news is I don't believe for a second that that will actually happen. I think we as well touch uh, on throughout the presentation, we can see significant initiatives and significant opportunities uh, to, uh, to move towards uh, a sustainable aviation future. Uh, next slide, please. So the other aspect that the thing, I don't think has been touched on uh, in the, the presentation so far in terms of the, the reason to decarbonize, obviously there is the uh, the good corporate citizens and and um, contributing towards uh, the sustainability of our planet that goes without saying and that that is a reason in itself uh, in order to uh, to make the changes that we need to make. However, there is also uh, an economic imperative uh, to to decarbonising aviation. I think it's fair to say that there is uh, if the industry doesn't take decarbonisation seriously and doesn't uh, make significant inroads into decarbonising uh, its, its emission levels and reducing its emission levels, there is the real risk and the real threat that uh, intervention 
could uh, result in smaller aviation. And we've already seen uh, ample evidence of that happening uh, in some countries across the world. So, for example, we're, we'll, we'll be aware of what happened in France, where um, domestic travel, uh, domestic aviation uh, for journeys of less than 2.5 hours has essentially been banned, and certain routes out of the, the main uh, Parisian hubs have, have been basically shut down uh, domestically. Uh, we saw the attempts to... By the the Dutch government to to ban the Amsterdam to Brussels uh, flight, which again was obviously subsequently uh, overturned. Uh, and you know, again, the, the mood, music, and political sentiment in countries such as Germany seems to be one which is uh, considering, if if not moving towards, but considering um, domestic aviation limitations. So there is a real danger that if we are not serious about decarbonisation, um, then we run the risk of um, aviation being um, regulated and reduced uh, as part of our, our wider climate goals, uh, which is obviously something for those of us who are passionate about this industry and passionate about the role that this industry has to play in society, we'd not like to see happen. The other aspect that I think that we, we need to factor into to the to the agenda is I think it would be remiss of us to ignore the, the economic impact of the, uh, the, the pandemic on aviation's um, um, business model and the, the the economics of aviation, you know, so the, the statistics from, I think it was, from, it was from ICAO, the airline sector saw its revenues drop by 65% compared to 2019, the airport sector by 66% by 20, uh, compared to 2019 levels. Um, so we're looking at an industry that is financially distressed, that is um, having to look at significant uh, and long-term spend at the same time that has had a, as, as big and as severe a battering financially as has ever had to endure in, in, in its existence. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a very challenging situation uh, for the industry. Um, but that's not to say that um, it's not a challenge that the industry is grabbing and grasping and moving forward with. Next slide, please. So in terms of where, where the industry should focus and what the industry should be doing, there are a number of areas which are uh, research, a number of themes which are research highlighted, um, which we, we think um, we should continue with. Um, so one which uh, I think we've touched on briefly, uh, we should be continuing to innovate around uh, aircraft design and the, the, the efficiency of the aircraft. You know, we, we do know that your, your modern aircraft, such as a 787 or an A350, you know, are circa 20% more uh, flight efficient and fuel efficient than the, uh, the comparative aircraft uh, from the previous generation. You know, m minor changes to to aircraft stock such as uh, retrofitting winglets onto aircraft, that in itself can, can produce a 5% a efficiency gain in terms of flight and fuel efficiency. So uh, th there is a lot that the industry can continue to do in terms of making sure that from an aircraft perspective, um, we are we are travelling in as efficient manner as possible. Um, obviously, there is the propulsion technologies uh, and sustainable aviation fuels, and I'll touch on uh, electric uh, propulsion and SAF in a bit more detail. Um, I won't dwell too much on those because I think we've touched on a lot of those beforehand. Um, but there's also the need in terms of, from an infrastructure point of view, uh, we need to be building the infrastructure to um, to support the, uh, the the sustainable aviation, both in terms of the infrastructure from a SAF perspective, the infrastructure from a new propulsion to, to, uh, perspective. So looking at the, uh, the electrification of aviation uh, and the ability to, to obviously recharge as part of the turn. And then also the, the next generation of, of, uh, of, of aircraft. So thinking specifically along the lines of the eVTOL, the the the, the, the vertical takeoff and landing vehicles, which we've been talking about. And again, there's ample evidence that the industry is really, really rising to this challenge now. You know, a great example of that. So uh, if you look at the, uh, the the Spanish infrastructure investor and owner, Ferrovio, who, who I know obviously has an interest uh, in, in some of our speakers uh, here today uh, in their organisations, you know, they, they've just announced that uh, in the last couple of weeks that they will be building 25 um, vertical takeoff and landing uh, uh, ports uh, across the UK 
for uh, for the e vitals uh, to be utilised across. Um, so again, there's really strong indicators that the, the aviation industry is um, rising to this challenge. But if you want to move to the next slide, I think the in terms of prioritisation, and I know Jonathan, you touched on this earlier on the the immediate game in town, and this one is one that that. It, it, it always baffles me why we have not made more progress on this uh, sooner, it, because it's it's frankly easy to do. Is airspace uh, modernisation and airspace reform? Um, airspace modernisation represents an immediate opportunity to improve flight efficiency. If you improve flight efficiency, you improve fuel burn, and the forecasts are you know from the the expert views are if you you modernise the structure of the airspace and you modernize the procedures and the techniques that are used to manage the airspace, that in itself could represent up to a 20% efficiency gain and 20% reduction in fuel uh, compared to how we are managing the airspace today. And, and I think that that, that that is a startling statistic, you know, because we're talking about an invisible infrastructure that doesn't need any new technology. It doesn't need any new... Uh, keep a pr production capability like we're touching on with SAS, uh, SAF. It can just happen. We can just make it happen. The challenge we have around uh, airspace modernization is balancing conflicting priorities. So, for example, um, one of the techniques which we we can we can apply to airspace modernization is instead of using stepped and staged descent of aircraft as they come into land into an air uh, into an airport, we use continuous descent and, cont uh, um, and continuous uh, departures. So we, we sequence the aircraft further out and we we, we gradually. Um, guide them into the airport on a continuous profile and and that might make you know makes um, perfect sense in terms of operationally to, to be uh, making that change but the challenge you have when you're you've got a gradual descent of, of an aircraft into an airport is that it's obviously it's coming in lower for longer and with lower for longer then there is the higher chance of noise and localized noise um, and that seems to be the resistance to to bringing about that change, you know, something which we we, as I say, from a from an efficiency point of view, would could happen tomorrow and would make an immediate meaningful impact uh, on on the, the the fuel burn levels and the flight efficiency. Um, so I think we as an industry and we as a society need to have and need to be prepared to have a really mature conversation about the trade offs that 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 this is going to require. Because as I say, here we have something that you know on the surface seems just so logical we should we could be doing and we should be cracking on with and there shouldn't be any resistance to it but we're not able to do it because of um the process and the concerns around you know a conflicting priority so i think that, that as i say the, there's something uh, significant for us all uh, to be having these informed discussions and and trying to balance and manage the trade-offs uh, that, that will need to take place uh, next slide please so um, I'm not going to dwell on this one in, in, in too much detail because I think that the, the previous speakers have, have talked about, you know, the, the various options in terms of, um, you know, propulsion technologies and, and fueling technologies, staff, you know, electric propulsion and hydrogen propulsion. I think we, we all know, you know, the, the, the where we are as an industry, SAF is, is probably the most realistic and tangible option in terms of aviation across all its various modes, you know, short haul, medium haul and, and, and long haul. I think that that is the, the, the solution. But the, there is obviously um, uh, significant technical capabilities come being developed uh, in terms of electric propulsion and alternative, uh, alternative uh, means of, of um, propulsion. Uh, driving the, the aircraft forward and and you know we can see again just announcements in in relation to electric and hydrogen propulsion you know you have the the, the right spirit aircraft which is a hundred seater um circa one hour um flight duration capable um 
aiming to come into operation by 2026. And I know there are many others. You know, when we see these types of capabilities coming along, I think you will see a significant change in the type of aircraft that are flown uh, for short haul and say, say domestic. I think there's a, a strong case for um, the, those those types of aircraft being very much prioritised for, for domestic aviation and, and, and short haul, ultra short haul aviation. You know, on, on top of that, you know, if you look at hydrogen technologies, there's some fascinating developments in, in that space. You know, we, we take the, the Zero Avia announcement over, over the last couple of weeks, which is a, 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 an agreement between um, the Royal Ship Oil Group uh, to to basically fund and, and support the development of, of a, a 19-seater hydrogen fuel aircraft in operation between the Netherlands and the UK, and, and that is intended to come into operation by 2024. So again, the, we're seeing strong and ample evidence that the technical in innovation is coming, uh, and it's only a matter of time before the, the, the next generation of, of aircraft are actually a reality uh, and with us. Next slide, please. Uh, I won't dwell too much on this one again. This is, I think, the point has been has been made in terms of you know the value that, that can be achieved and the benefit that can be achieved from SAF and from electric propulsion. Um, I think it's it's it's, it's, it's widely regarded and it's, it's 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 definitely easily understood as you know the the benefit to us in terms of sustainability from from both these initiatives. Next slide, please. So, in in terms of you know just to um, focus on one last area before I bring bring the presentation to a conclusion. Um, I think there is definitely an interesting and very exciting opportunity uh, in terms of electric propulsion and specifically in terms of e the EV eVTOL. Um, I think eVTOLs for short haul and ultra short haul uh, and urban air mobility. It is such an exciting development in, in the world of aviation. And, and if you look at what, what is happening uh, with, with that regard, if you look at um, investments which are being made in the technology, um, uh, including, you know, for example, the uh, Virgin Atlantic's investment in up to 100 and, uh, 150 um, EV tolls um, from vertical aerospace. Uh, if, if you look at the, the investments around the, the infrastructure from Ferrovial uh, in terms of the, the, uh, the eVTOL ports across across the UK, there, there is very, very, very strong evidence that um, we are approaching the next generation or a new exciting mode of aviation. And I, when I think about it, I think about it um, both, both in terms of the 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 opportunity from an operational perspective and how we can start to leverage these these capabilities into the into the business model of aviation but also then what what, what does it allow us to do differently and um, what where where does it um, allow us to think differently and what what markets can we be, we start to serve and you know again here sitting sitting from glasgow and sitting in scotland you know i'm very excited by the notion of eVTOL and what it means to regional connectivity. Uh, connectivity. We had uh, um, Derek at the start talking about um, the, the drone delivery service for the Highlands and Islands here in, in Scotland. You know, I, I can see the same principles being applied to eVTOL. You know, so you know what what was feasibly you know a, a five six hour car journey to the the Highlands of Scotland suddenly becomes you know a, a thirty minute uh, flying taxi. You know, and that in itself changes the dynamic. Of you, your 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 um, your airport uh, as a destination uh, and the country as 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 a, a as a tourism choice, and I think that that is really really exciting in terms of the, the business opportunities that, that that are presented off the back of of these new modes of, of aviation. Uh, next slide, please. But it's not without challenge in itself, you know. As, as we know, aviation is a, an industry that is rightly proud of its safety culture. We we have a very, very strong uh, regulatory process. We have a strong uh, certification process. And the, the, the process of adding these new airspace users into controlled airspace will, will, will not be uh, a, a simplistic challenge. Uh, and not, not least because there is a, a fundamental difference between how 
air traffic control is, is performed from a commercial aviation point of view, which is primarily centred around the human controlling the airspace, to if you look at, say, uh, how the likes of Amazon Prime or, say, Google, so on, have, have developed their autonomous drone services, where it's essentially the aircraft itself maintaining separation. Those two um, approaches are fairly fundamentally different, and we somehow need to find a way uh, in which those 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 approaches can can coexist together. Um, and I, and I'm 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 optimistic about the, the ability to do so, but it won't be with without challenges in, in its own right. Uh, and then we can see here the sev several other challenges in relation to the adoption of electric uh, VTOL capability within aviation. Not not least my the the one the last one on screen, which I think is quite interesting. You you have the uh, likelihood that these aircraft will either be uh, pilotless uh, or remotely piloted or single single pilot. So you've got the psychological factor. Would you enter um, a, an aircraft wh which is pilotless? You know, I, I, I kind of laugh at that one and when I reflect on it. You know, in aviation, you know, we, we've had a hard enough time getting people to sit on rear-facing seats. You know, would you actually go on an aircraft that is pilotless? So it's um, there are, it's not without challenge, but um, as is often the case, the, the issue here isn't technical. Um, the, the issue is, is, is wider than that. Um, next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, I think it's fair to say that decarbonisation is the absolute imperative of the aviation sector. Um, it is really in the last 20 months, I, I, I think, you know, as, as someone observing the sector, it has really risen to the top of the list in terms of what the industry needs to be focusing on. Uh, the good news, you know, we, as I say, from 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 the challenge that we have, we know it's going to be difficult. We know it's not going to be easy to decarbonise. We know that. But what we can say, as hopefully we've heard across the presentation and across the discussions today, is that momentum is on our side. There are tangible things that can be done today that will make a difference, airspace modernisation. And then we can see a whole, whole new range of exciting developments, whether it be the further development of SAF, which is really gathering momentum, the eVTOL, the development of these new aircraft, so on. But I think the, the main point for me that, that gives me uh, the hope for the future is the sense of the community coming together to rise to this challenge. The, the word collaborate in communities and partnership uh, has been used by a numerous speakers today. And I think there's a very strong reason for that. As an industry, we coexist together. We can't operate without each other. As an industry, we will come together to solve the sustainable aviation challenge together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. That, that's excellent and a, and a great way to end what's been a fascinating afternoon. And I think your presentation, the fact that you touched on all the other uh, challenges facing us, but, you know, I do have just written down momentum is on our side and yeah. I think that that's that's come across in spades I would have to maybe uh, quibble a bit on the airspace modernization piece as somebody who's been chased out of many a town hall um, when when you know I think the challenge really is how how do we get the local communities around our our airports to, to um, you know understand the reason why we need to do this but fantastic presentation I'm afraid we've, we've, we've run out of time um, but I would like to, to thank all of our, our, our speakers uh, again. Um, you know, this was the first session. We will be back tomorrow. Uh, we will be joined tomorrow by Adam Martin, uh, Morton, who's the head of environmental technology at Rolls Royce. Dr. Thomas Budd, lecturer in airport planning and management at Cranfield University. Will Wright, an A320 pilot, young air pilots chair for the honorable company of air pilots. Valentina Vecchio, Sustainability Policy and Partnership uh, Lead for Boeing. Peter Raffano, uh, the Environmental Intelligence uh, at Enviro Suite. And that will be chaired by a colleague of mine, Fiona Smith, Group Head of Aerodrome Strategy at AGS Airports. So once again, I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to join uh, the session this afternoon. But in particular, I'd like to thank our speakers, Derek Proven, Jonathan Council, Dan Williams, Jean Gabolis, and lastly, Martin Bowman. Thank you, everyone, and we we'll look forward to hopefully seeing you again tomorrow. Goodbye. Thanks, Brian.